Let's hear the scripture this morning as it comes to us from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, the the first letter to the Corinthians, third chapter. What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Well, welcome 2018. Welcome to a new year of changes. Pretty much every year when we come to this uh, New Year's Day time, we hear a Sunday message about change. And really, Perry did that for us last week, encouraging us to look back in time, look forward in time, assess our life in the here and now. And we're just taught then to sort of hold on to the goodness and let go of the junk, to to live in hope and, and release the fear, to adjust our sails and ride the mystery of the future and trust that God will ride it with us. And that's what we say. That's what we say. Usually, though, we're talking about what you should do in your world. And today, we know then that change is something that's coming to our little corner of the world here at Zionsville United Methodist Church. In a few short weeks, I will no longer be your senior pastor. I will be laying aside the preacher's mantle to uh, try to help some folks in a new role with the United Methodist Foundation of Indiana. Now that's going to mean a change for you and a drastic change for me. Um, You will all lose one person in your constellation, but I will lose hundreds. But that's just the way it is sometimes. Uh, But the mission always remains the same, always the same. Now, I am aware that a pastoral change brings a lot of mixed emotions. Some people cry from grief, some cry from joy. (laughs) Some say goodbye, some say good riddance. Uh, Some will miss the familiar voice on Sunday morning, and some will miss it like they miss the sound of fingernails on a chalkboard. And I know that, and you know it too. In fact, one of the things I appreciate about, uh, about folks in this church family is that you pretty much get it about a lot of things. You hope for the best, but you know that only sometimes do we reach our best. And you have accepted my strengths and not condemned me in my weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 4 says that we have this treasure in jars of clay. We have the treasure of the gospel of the ministry of the gospel in jars of clay. What does the Bible mean? It means that we hold something glorious in bodies, in humanness, that is fragile and easily broken. We hold this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So God uses us, even when we're not perfect. And I appreciate that so many of you already have thanked me for the way that my life and my ministry has been helpful to you. But those of you that really know me know how helpful you have been to me. And I know, and you know, we're all people just doing the best that we know how. And yet in the midst of that, God has this all-surpassing power that seems to rise above us and make his truth known anyway. And that's why I love the church. That's why I love you. You know, when I look out up here every Sunday morning, I don't see hypocrites or sinners or problems. I see people. I see God's power And to an outsider, our lives must look ordinary. But to me, they look like carriers of grace. 
Friends, you don't have to be perfect to be powerful. Take that thought into 2018. And while there's no way that people can think about their faith apart from the people and the pastors who are part of it, we will always then want to remember that God is what makes a church a church. Not a Sunday school teacher or a trustee or a pastor. I think of the words of Paul in writing his first letter to the church at Corinth. He was a pastor there once. And then he left and another pastor came and that person's name was Apollos. Man, I wish my mom had named me Apollos. Isn't that a great name? Glenn. Really? (laughs) So the problem in Corinth was that people did what people do. Rather than live a life of accepting and thanking, they lived a life of comparison and judgment. Some of them there knew the words of the first disciple, Peter, who was known by his Greek word name Cephas. Some remembered Paul as the founding pastor, and they wanted everything to be the way that he had done it, and some now found Apollos to be the one that they championed, and perhaps they found their faith when he was at the helm or in the pulpit. And the letter to the Corinthian begins, in fact, it, its main purpose in Paul writing it was just to straighten people out about this thing called church. And he says in the first few verses of the book, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, and another, I follow Cephas, and still another, I follow Christ. In other words, I'm the true Jesus follower. In other words, folks were trying to decide who they liked the best, who they trusted the most, who was more important than others, and so on. That's what we do too. If we think of Christianity on a larger scale, even here we do that. We're always doing that. My pastor at church A is better than your pastor at church B. And if we figure out who's the best, then we all know where we should go and what we should do and all of that. And then Paul says something in the third chapter that's important. What, after all, is Apollo? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So Paul had a task, Apollos had a task, and each did what they did. And they did the best they knew how. They built on each other rather than tear each other down. And Paul knew enough to appreciate a leader's strengths, but he also knew enough to know that God makes it grow. Everybody say, God makes it grow. grow. So this church started over around Eagle Creek. Now, mind you, it started because some Christians who were part of the faith started it. So it didn't start from scratch. It was a continuation of the mission of God in life and in the world. Just a tiny group of people. And God made it grow. Built a building down on the brick street. Then it grew. Built one on Oak Street. We beat Starbucks to Oak Street. We beat City Hall. And then just built one right here. But it was never about the buildings, you know. That's just where we knew to come to remind ourselves of the all-surpassing power of God, the one who makes for growth and new life. And my goodness, the... My life has just been blessed because of this place. It's a privilege to be part of it for me. And I hope that you feel that way because you should. And you need to know that I don't 
I mean, I don't move away from Zionsville United Methodist Church. I'm not angry. I'm not hurt. I've not been mistreated. Well, some of you maybe, but you know. I don't leave disappointed in people or thinking people are faithless or lack passion or are apathetic or won't get with the program. On the contrary, I'm thankful. I'm just thankful. And Zionsville United Methodist Church has things that we can work on. I can think of about 50 of them. And in fact, there are some really important things that I feel very bad about leaving undone. But I just want to say that's good news. Because when, when a new senior pastor arrives, and, and, and then we don't like something, or the new pastor doesn't like something, we can all then say with truth and conviction, that blasted Glenn, he left a mess. And I just, please feel free to say it. Because it'll make you feel better. And there might be more than a hint of truth in it. ZUMC has things we can work on. But friends, ZUMC is a good place. The people on this year's leadership teams are really solid. And they serve this church. We have servant leaders. I don't have time in a single message to talk about all of the outreach ministries that we do that are vital in lifting lives. Everything from praying prayers to people for fixing lunch for them. This week we're, we're housing another round of people who are currently without homes. They'll be living in this church. Tonight, five or six dozen youth will worship here and they'll find a safe place to talk about their lives and their faith and find friends and find support. The staff here is, is stable and, and the morale is good. They're doing a lot of good work. And were you here on Christmas Eve? How many of you were here on Christmas Eve? It was great, wasn't it? I mean, did you hear the music? Did you see the children with their candles? Wasn't that beautiful? Some of you are going to have wax on the back of your clothes this morning from those candles. If you'll look at the back of your pews. Well, that's, you know, God is in this place. So we see his power if we open our eyes. We feel his growth. Our past is of him. Our present is in him. Our future is with him. Of that I have no doubt. And quite frankly, I'm very excited for what comes next here. I'm excited for you. You may or may not be, but I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the next person who gets to come and, and preach here. They're, 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 they're getting the keys to a Cadillac. Over 175 years this church has been here. It's been growing. Sometimes in size, sometimes in spirit. And thank God for all of those pastors and church leaders and church family who serve the Lord here. But Paul is reminding us, God makes it grow. And God isn't going anywhere, friends. And of course, you shouldn't either, or you might miss it. I've been thinking a little bit about the next couple weeks. So if you will then, you know, permit me, of course, of course you will. <laughs> I just thought about what I would say if I just tried to condense everything that I believe about following Christ into just a final few thoughts. I mean, like if you could, if you knew that this was your last three or four weeks on earth and you just tried to condense everything into two or three chats with your children, you know, what would you try to tell them? So that's just a little bit of what I hope to do with you. And I'm, I won't get it all in, but I'm going to try. So that's going to be the next couple weeks. And then there's one more thing. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. But I, I, I want it to be a great thing. And, and, and you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the confounded mortgage. When I came here, we all owed together, and when I came here, that meant me too, over $3 million to the bank. 
So today, I stand before you. I asked our treasurer the other day. She sent me an email. Said we're looking at $114,000. Now, that's good. Yeah, that's great. So I'm going to have my last Sunday with you on January 28th. Friends, let's knock it out. And you'll be hearing a little bit more about this. Um, ne next Sunday, I don't know who, somebody here that's got skills, I don't, we'll build a box. I'm going to put a box out in the lobby, and when you come in, put your money in. Um, the pledge cycle's done. Uh, just put it in and every week we'll have somebody count it before the end of the service and we'll talk about it and we'll get that thing down. Um, you know, two times since I have been here we have taken up a one-time offering that has exceeded $90,000 and I was just thinking to myself, could we just do it one more time for the Gipper, you know. <laughs> and I believe we can do this because we can set this ministry free from this burden. You know, we, we can set it the future free for ministry instead of debt. We can free the pastor and all of you for vision and ministry instead of worry and doubt. We can and we will. I hope somebody calls me when you burn the mortgage. In fact, you know, I have a dream about that. Because th this, this is what Glenn, this is the way Glenn sees it. So we, we pay that thing off and Farmers Bank holds our mortgage. I don't know. There's one in Lebanon, but I think the head office is in Frankfurt. Is that right? Okay, there you go. You must have loans there too. Yes, okay. <laughs> I understand. I have this vision that we like, you know, we like get the mortgage. And then, and we get up, we get a torch, like an Olympic torch, and we start at the bank. <laughs> and then we we start coming to the church, right? And so we start strong, so we get some of our runners, because we've got runners in this congregation. I see Amy's at the back. Amy, just stand up very briefly, Amy. Stand up, come on. Stand up. So Amy runs, Amy runs about two marathons every day. That's what Amy does. And so Amy's going to take the start us on the leg, and she's going to run, and then I see some other people. I see David Carr, where I saw David, didn't I? Right there. Get on your running shoes, Ken Narva. There's some people around here. We'll run, but it won't just be the athletes. We'll just let everybody get in. So everybody in the church is going to get a chance. Bring your dog. We'll tape the mortgage to your pet. Get on a bike. If We'll get our older people involved because we'll just come out with a wheelchair. And we'll let them carry it in a wheelchair. We'll push them for a quarter of a mile. But everybody who wants to gets to touch this all the way in here. And then we finally will come into the church right? And when we come into the church, we're, we're going to have a, a trumpet playing the theme from Rocky. <laughs> and we're going to come up and we're going to put that paper on the altar and then I'm going to run and I'm, I'm going to soak it with gasoline all over the altar. And we're going to throw the torch in there and there's just going to be this huge flame that's going to go up everywhere and the trumpet's going to start blaring. And one of the McKnight family is going to get on the tuba. There's always some McKnight playing a tuba somewhere. And we're going to sing, we're going to sing. We're just like, uh, like, uh, like, like when the saints, something like when the saints go march. You know that in? Like, oh, when the lone goes up in flames. Oh, when the lone. Goes... Sing it with me. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number when the lone goes up in flames. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes, and Deck McCormick. Deck, stand up just for a second. Dex, the head of our finance committee, Dex starts crying. <laughs> and the tears start going down his eyes. And of course, the fire then, yes, thank you, Dex. <laughs> and then the fire sets off, the, 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 water, the, uh, the water sprouts up above us, and the water starts coming down, and the alarms are going. And up in heaven, the archangel Gabriel, you know, elbows somebody and says, Come over here and look at this because it's about to get rowdy down there. And uh, all of a sudden, Kyle Wheat, older, where's Kyle? Kyle, stand up, stand up. Kyle's the head of the trustees, and, all, and he can't have a fire in the church because he knows our insurance. So he grabs a fire extinguisher, and he starts running to the altar. But, that, but, but Perry, stand up, Perry. Perry won't let him. 
So Perry starts to wrestle Kyle right down here in front of the church. And the fire department comes flying in here. And and three or four of those firemen, they get saved and get Jesus before they even get down to the altar. And all of a sudden, Pastor Gentry comes running down the center aisle with snakes and he starts speaking in tongues. Right? And the choir bursts out in the hallelujah chorus. And it's just, it's just this amazing thing. The, 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 the flames burning, the songs are going up, the water's coming down, the sirens are going, the trumpets are blaring, Gabriel's laughing, Dex's crying, Montgomery and Weedholder wrestling. The news channels gets on cable news. Next thing you know, every single person in the world knows that for one day, Zionsville United Methodist Church was on fire for Jesus. <laughs> now, I don't really know what you'll do when the time comes, but that's how I see it in my head. And you can let an old pastor dream. God makes it grow. The good gospel news that we heard all last month was Emmanuel. God is with us. Or as Jesus put it on his last day on earth, go make disciples of all nations and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. To the end of the age. That means to the end of time as we know it. And that's why for more than 175 years, in fact, for more than 2,000 years, we who follow Jesus come to his house and we gather at his table and we share in his meal and we remember he is with us. In truth, we remember that he is delivering the mission, and we are with him. And that is a perspective we need. Jesus is here. God makes it grow. And we get to offer our lives for the ride. And in all of life's changes, that doesn't. Our scripture tells us that on the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took bread, and he broke bread, and he said to his disciples, take and eat this, this is my body given for you. Eat it and remember me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Remember that you're forgiven. And so as long as we eat and we drink, we call him again to ourselves, and we call ourselves again to him. And we know that all will be well today tomorrow, and forever. As the servers come forward, I would invite us to pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of the bread and the cup because this is the center of who we are. The center of who we are is your grace, your forgiveness, your new life which has been offered freely to every single one of us here, regardless of who we are today. So we eat and we drink with glad hearts today and confident in your spiritual nourishment in our life and in our church. In Christ's name we pray, amen.